I'm Adam DeBono. I'm going to talk about uh, going mobile second, taking a desktop app and bringing it down to a mobile device. Uh, I work for Affinity Live, which is a big sort of uh, business startup. We make business management software in the cloud. Um, and I'm going to draw a bit on that experience that, of what I've done bringing their big desktop web app down to mobile. Uh, so before I start, I uh, just want to show you this. I was reading Twitter and I came across this. So UI UX design is a maze. It's like those puzzles that require you to draw intricate shape by connecting all the dots with a single stroke. So like this one, you have to not lift your pen off the page and all the lines have to be straight. So easy. Five lines, you can do it. But sure, you can complete the dot puzzle in five lines instead of four. But if there's a way to do it in four, aren't you obliged to know how, uh, to find out how? And this is exactly the way you have to think when you're doing mobile design. You have to sort of escape the boundaries. And in this case, you literally have to escape the boundaries. And so yeah, mobile design is all about thinking in this way. Um, because mobile design imposes so many limits on you. And if you didn't already work it out, you can actually solve this puzzle in three lines. So let's talk about mobile first. As many of you have probably noticed, the current trend in mobile development, well, even software development in general, is mobile first. And there's plenty of good reasons for it. Uh, mobile device usage and ownership is well on the rise. And it forms a major po portion overall uh, and just keeps on going up. But for many of us, mobile first isn't an option. We already have these complete, full-featured apps uh, designed for desktop. So what do we do when we want mobile apps? How do we go about redesigning or re-architecting our apps to be usable on small devices? So to start with, let's talk about some differences in the platforms. So first and most obvious thing is the screen size. A desktop has a larger screen size, much larger usually than its mobile's counterpart. This means you can fit more, far more on the screen at once. And although on a mobile device it's acceptable to make content a lot smaller, seeing the devices are used closer to the user, and they generally have a far higher resolution in terms of dots per inch, uh, even to the point where the pixel count is higher than a desktop, you've still got a lot less space for content. And you interact with these devices differently as well. Traditionally, on a computer, you have a keyboard and a mouse or a trackpad if you're using a laptop. Uh, on a mobile device, you interact directly with the screen using usually touch, sometimes with a stylus. Touch interfaces are far less accurate compared to a mouse or a trackpad, meaning that interactive elements have to be way larger. So you need to use more of your very limited screen real estate to make these actions bigger. And while the speed of mobile computing is constantly increasing, they still don't come close to matching the speed of desktop computing. That being said, mobile devices generally appear to run faster due to a number of things. But importantly, mobile devices only run a single app at a time. Now, a desktop potentially runs everything you have installed all at the same time. And obviously, apps do run in the background. but uh, you've got to remember that a user doesn't actually see this, and most consumers don't really understand how all of this magic works. So the next really important thing is that when you leave your desk, you leave your computer behind. Or if you, you, you take your laptop with you, you can't pull it out of your pocket and start using it. It just doesn't work. If you take your mobile device, it's always with you and it's always on. And finally, sorry, not finally, uh, you should never assume that you have a constant network connection. A desktop computer will pretty much always have a reliable network connection. Uh, and one of the consequences of taking it with you is that on a mobile device, the network is always changing. You have to adapt. So finally, and I think this is really important, a mobile device is packed full of sensors. On a desktop computer, you usually have a camera, 
you can get other things like the voltage going through the CPU, but most computers don't really, most consumers don't really care about this. On a mobile device, you've got everything from accelerometers, cameras, GPS. And so there really is a lot different between mobile devices and desktop devices. And it's really important to take a step back and actually analyze these differences when you're going from your desktop interface to a mobile interface. So where do you start? I like to start with navigation right at the top. It, it gives you a good structure for, um, for designing your application. And it really uh, gives you a direction as to where you're going. Good navigation can be the difference between a good app and a bad app. And unsurprisingly, nav bad navigation is one of the most common complaints with bad apps. So since navigation operates from such a high level, subtle differences can have a dramatic effect on the user experience. Further to this, navigation can actually add to the overall design of an app. Although, uh, and this goes further than just appearance. You can easily add visual separation, and intuitive animations, which all adds to the user experience. Designing top level navigation can be very tricky since there are a lot of things to consider. Although in some ways, porting from a desktop app can make this process a whole lot easier in the sense that you already know what content you've got. So how do we define good navigation? This can be a very difficult thing since it can depend on the context and in the end, it comes down mainly to personal preference. However, there are a few characteristics that are common to all good forms of navigation. Firstly, it should be simple, easy, and transparent. It should be something that is inherently intuitive and immediately understood and out of the way. When you see a pen, you immediately know how to write with it. Even though there are hundreds of types of pens, you know that you can pick it up and start writing with it. You don't have to think about it. You don't think about draw a line, draw a curve. You just draw an A. With navigation, it should operate in the same way. You should not have to think about it. It should just work. The other important characteristics are that you should tell a user where they are and where they can go. And at the very least, you should be providing hints as to these two things. The most important thing to a user's path through content is that it's logical, predictable, and easy to follow. Now, if you wanted to categorize navigation, one way to do it is persistent versus transient. Persistent navigation are those that are always there and always available. It's immediately clear what options are available and almost always show state. Transient navigation is pretty much the exact opposite. It's hidden by default, must be explicitly revealed or automatically revealed when the developer decides it's a good idea. So it's not clear what options you have unless the thing is actually open, and it, since it lives off screen. And it doesn't show state, or at most, it only shows state once it's been revealed. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds like a pretty bad user experience. Unfortunately, it's one of the most common things you see at the moment with these slide menus, or hamburger menus, or anything else that they're getting called. I don't think they have an actual proper name. In spite of this presenting a terrible user experience, developers and designers continue to use it everywhere. And I've done it myself. Now, the list menu, which you can see in the settings app, is similar, but it's just a navigation controller, and it works by itself. It's obvious where each option is going to take you. It partially shows state in the sense that when you go to the next screen, it comes up with a back button in the top left, which tells you what screen you just came from. Um, however, things can become extremely complex once you start adding more functionality, and Apple have gone way too far with this screen because there are masses of options in the first screen, and then if you go, say, to the general screen, there's another mass of options there, and it just becomes a massive pain in the ass to work out where you are and where you can go in the app. So if you want to add a custom keyboard, for example, I think there's about six taps involved to do that. So the more common form of the slide menu is like this one in the LinkedIn app. Uh, to start with, it's not immediately clear that the slide menu even exists because they've used their, icon, their logo as the icon, as the button, sorry, to actually open the menu. They've used a couple of 
dots to integrate, integrate that you can actually grab the button, but it's still pretty crappy. The other thing that they've done is that uh, the menu is highly custom, which looks nice, but it doesn't tell you where you are, and it's not immediately clear what each item in that menu is actually going to do. For example, if I tap on my name or my picture, where's that going to go? If I click on upgrade to premium, is that going to do something different? So what alternatives are there? One is the screen board or the grid style interface. It provides a number of benefits, including the ability to pretty much design it however you want, make it look fantastic while still being extremely simple. You can have a large number of options or a small number of options. Designers usually go with four, six, or nine, depending on uh, how important each options are and how much they want to show. And since, but since all major platforms have chosen to use this style of interface as their home screen, you have to be careful when using it because users expect these things to behave in a certain way. And as such, you should only ever use them as a top-level navigation and be very careful with the sorts of animations you use uh, when interacting with them. Uh, so Facebook's iOS app from way back in 2009 was one of the first to pick this sort of true springboard style of navigation. Um, and they were very quick to go away, back away from it as well. They used pagination to allow many items and badges which show status as well. But very importantly, the screen is customizable, which mimicked, which still mimics the iOS home screen. Now, Apple's great new Apple Store app includes this really nice looking screen. Like on their website, you can browse the app by choosing what device you are interested in. But the most important part of this interface isn't actually that grid. It's the fact that they've used the search at the top. So you can just completely bypass their whole navigation system and search exactly what you're looking for. Now finally, Bugshot, which if you haven't used it, it's just an app for annotating screenshots of, uh, of apps, really. Um, and it has this nice grid view. And all it is is just a grid of screenshots. Um, and when you tap one, it takes over this full screen with a simple uh, increase animation. And when you go back, it's a decrease animation again. The simple animation, it doesn't just make the app feel more polished, but it provides a sense of state in the sense that it just tells you where you've came from and it tells you where you're going back to. Now, as people start to move away from the slide menu, the tab bar seems to be what people are looking towards. Now, there are a lot of different variations on the tab bar, as you can see just with these three screenshots here. Um, but there are very good reasons to move to the tab bar. Uh, it's a great way to present a small number of screens with a flat information structure, and it presents very well for each of the good characteristics I showed before. Uh, it's no surprise that not only is the tab bar a built-in component in iOS, but it's used extensively within Apple's own apps. So for example, the App Store. The app uses the tab bar to organize a few different ways to browse the store. It allows the user to quickly flick between tabs and remembers the state within each tab. And they've used the status indicator on the updates tab as well to provide a little bit more context. It simply gives more information so users know what to expect when they tap on that button. So the tab bar in the Documents app behaves a little differently. The first three tabs allow you to browse files from local storage, iCloud, and other internet accounts. They've dedicated a whole tab for advertising, which is something that you should never, ever do because it just gets in the way and it very much annoys users. Uh, and the final tab is not really a tab. You pull it across the screen and it presents a browser. And even when you tap it, it does a, a weird animation to bring the browser into, into play. While this is nice, the problem is it's not consistent with what a tab bar should do and how it should behave. Um, and that being said, they've redesigned the button. So you can see that it, there's a couple of little drag bars on the side there. And there's a sort of rounded um, overlay on the button. But users will still expect them to behave in a certain way. And they're not always going to recognize that that's different 
on the first try. And the first try is always a very important thing. And the Shazam app makes a similar mistake. Four of the, ha the tabs behave normally, but the center tab is not a tab at all. It's an action button. When you press it, it takes you to a different screen. And the tab bar disappears. And once again, this is just inconsistent and unfamiliar to most users. So if you want something completely custom, you can go with a metaphor, which is something that a user can relate to. Now, when I say metaphor, you're probably thinking skeuomorphic, which is right in some sense, but contrary to popular belief, that doesn't mean going down to the fabric store and getting green felt. In fact, the term is actually much, much broader, and it defines as simply the overlapping of design concepts across different mediums. And when it's done well, skill morphs and metaphors can make a new interface feel very comfortable and very familiar. And Apple still use it right through the operating system, including since iOS 7, even though it's not as obvious anymore. In iBooks, they still have that great page turn transition when you, where you can grab the screen and it'll pick up the page, like picking up a page in a real book. So when you get to the end of the text, you can pick up the page and be ready to turn that page as soon as you read the last word so you don't miss anything. And that's, I guess, an unexpected feature of being able to do something like that, but it just feels more natural. And even though they've completely redesigned the book library, it's really still a shelf. So the Flightboard app, another great designed app, it represents the typical arrival and departure boards you see at airports, right down to the animations. The list, however, does behave slightly inconsistently with the platform in the sense that uh, more detail is opened up in line as opposed to on a separate screen, which is not something you always want to do. And in this sense, an actual flight board, you can't tap it on it to see more detail. It doesn't show more detail than what's up there. So in this case, that's probably more of a bad thing. And the other thing they've done is their font, which looks amazing. It looks like an actual flight font from a, um, the giant pixel board that you would see in an airport. But when you're in a rush, it can be hard to read. And when you're in an airport, you're usually in a rush. And so these little things can make a big difference to the usability of apps, even though it looks great. And then Apple's calculator app is a calculator. There's not really anything more to say about that. It's just a calculator. You know how to use it when you open the app. And so there are tons of others. Passbook uses a card style interface. Mint uses a dashboard style interface. And sorry, Skype uses the Windows Metro style interface, which I personally don't recommend to use on an iOS app. Clear is gesture based. Maps is based around search, and the Tips app is page-based. And there are heaps more. The important thing is that you choose the one that is most relevant to your app. So how do you choose one? As I mentioned previously, knowing what content you have and what features you have make a big difference. So you can use all of this knowledge and content to make an informed decision. But there are a few questions you'll want to ask yourself. And when you do, get in the mind of your users. So how much do you actually need to show? Your desktop interface could have masses of content all over the screen, because that's just the nature of desktop interfaces. When your users are at their desk, they need fast access to all of that information. But on a mobile, think about what they'll actually need and try to eliminate as much as you can. How much can you group? Your desktop interface likely has a very flat structure. Due to the nature of the platform, it just allows you to place content everywhere. Try to group and categorize each area of content so that it doesn't all have to be displayed at once. And finally, what is going to be used most frequently? Obviously, the more frequently a user needs to access a certain item or feature, uh, the more prominent it should be. You don't want to have many top-level objects in your interface, so choose the one that will be used the most. So let's take a look at a real example of this happening. 
Now this is not a plug, this is just taking from my experience. So I've worked at Affinity Live for about a year now and my main task has been developing for iOS, including the initial release, and doing this hasn't been easy. Affinity Live is a monolithic application and with years of feature development in its past. So let's take a look at the desktop interface for a moment. And if you look at, want to take a look at just the navigation, it's the gray and black area at the top, and it's packed full of stuff. Each module has its own menu, and each, in each menu there are a ton of links, and then above that there's a quick access bar, which goes to a whole other range of things. And then on the right, there's a search interface. It's just not feasible to take this navigation and dump it into a series of menus. It's not intuitive, and it and would be a nightmare to navigate, taking this straight to mobile. So when the app was initially built, there wasn't too much design input. The app was needed, and we pushed hard, and we used the slide menu. And we haven't found it to work very well. So what are we doing now? We're going through and we're asking ourselves those questions that I mentioned before. How how much do we need to show? How much can we group? And what's going to be used most frequently? And so we're now transitioning to a tab style interface, but we're not showing each module. We're thinking about what is a mobile user going to want to use most? The task board is something they're going to want to use most because they want to know what are they working on today? What are they working on tomorrow? Clients and contacts are good, but you might only just want to search for them. And when you search for them, you just want to type someone's name you want to see their company and their contact come up. So this should provide a more logical structure and allows us, our users to access what they need most. So once you have navigation sorted, you have your basic content structure. From there, each app will follow their different design path and for design and development. But there's a few more things that I want to talk about. So first, let's look at reducing complexity. So what exactly do I mean by this? Don't fill your screens up with crap. You're going to have a lot of content on your screen at once, on the desktop, but you don't want to do this on mobile. You want to make sure that your content is structured logically and of generally avoid increasing the cognitive burden on your users. Mobile apps should contain quick, app, quick to access and glanceable information. So how do you do this? Prioritize, focus on content, and focus on context. So let's take a look at prioritizing. What information is more important? The most important information should obviously be at the top of the screen. It should appear more prominent on the screen. Uh, and medium and low priority information should just be left out if possible. So for example, this is the client detail screen on the desktop app and in the iOS app. We've left out a lot of crap that we didn't need because we realized that most of it you don't need on a mobile device. The important information, including their name and their website, is at the top of the screen. And the priority decreases the further you go down the screen. So focusing on content. Now, if you watched any of the WWDC presentations from last year when they just introduced iOS 7, deference is a word that you will have heard a lot. It's the ninth word in the iOS human interface guidelines if you want to go and read that. So, but what does it mean? It means that your app is all about content, not about anything else, just content. Uh, the interface should just get out of the way. Your users should be attracted to content, not logos or not branding, not anything else. So we tried to apply this on the task view screen in Affinity Live. So on the left, you can see the desktop. On the right, you can see the iOS version. Now, when you look at that screen, your eyes are attracted to one thing, the top. We've used the purple to indicate the actual status, which is accepted. And we've also placed other content in there that's very important, like how much work is left to be done? Is it overdue, which you can see with the circle we've got it in red. You can also see what the title of the task is, when it starts, and when it's due to be finished. 
So with the clever use of color, which we can draw the user to the information they need the most. And focusing on the current context, you should keep screens narrowly focused on one or two pieces of content or features. Don't show any extra information, even if it might be relevant. You want to keep screens as minimal as possible. Also, you'll want to respond to the current context. Depending on the path you took to a certain screen, you may want to present information differently or show some different content. So all of these using Affinity Live are narrowly focused to show one thing. It's their primary purpose. We don't want to overload the screen with potentially relevant, but also potentially interfering content. So for example, when viewing a contact, you can see that they belong to a company, but we don't show any other information about that company. If you want to, if you want to view the information about that company, you can tap on it and go to a different screen but we keep it limited to just that contact because that's what this screen is all about. So the second thing I want to talk about is remaining consistent and familiar. Users have come to expect certain behaviors, especially on mobile, and it's what happens when they've used these devices for years. For this reason, it's important to develop your app so that it's consistent with the platform. However, you want to maintain familiarity with your desktop application, who your users already use. Getting the right mix can be very difficult, but hitting a sweet spot will make your application a whole lot easier to use and a whole lot faster to use. Now, you can do this in a number of ways, uh, using color and gestures, but one of the most important things you have to do is maintain integrity. And when I'm talking about integrity, I'm not just saying moral principles and ethical principles, although this does come into it. What I mean is that you want to maintain a clear message to your users. If you have a fun and lighthearted desktop application, you want to reflect this in your mobile app. Uh, and this comes down to many things, including color palette and wording. Um, and this can be difficult to get right for many reasons. It's hard to be consistent across one application, let alone multiple, and across multiple platforms your message may need to be slightly different anyway to suit the language of the platform. So with Affinity Live, we have a product that is for professionals and for businesses. It has the mentality of getting work done, so it's function first. But we try to take a more lighthearted approach rather than full on serious business, and this has been hard to replicate in the mobile app, but something that we haven't really run into many problems with yet because what we've tried to do is focus on content so much that we've really removed the borders of the application. So the tone of the application is really dictated by the actual content that users have inside the app. Color is a very important tool for designers since it can be used to represent many things. And assuming you use a color palette for your desktop application, Use the same one in your mobile application. Use tint colors, subtle background colors for branding, and use color to indicate status and context. Color is very effective in brightening up an application, but you'll want to avoid it using, using it too much as it can very, very easily distract and impose on what the user is actually trying to do. So we've used color in many, in many places. So the background of the slide menu uses our blue color as a solid background, which helps to separate it from the main view of the application. And we've actually put a little bit of a pattern in there as well, just to give it a little bit of style so it's just not a flat blue. And you can also see in the task board that the 25th is highlighted, and we've used our blue to represent it as well. And I found that using a lightened form of the tint color in the navigation bar, which might be difficult to see on this projector, but the navigation bar and the toolbar are actually not plain white. And even though it's subtle, I found that it actually makes a big difference in helping your application just not to feel stark and like everything else. And I found that it works a lot better than using full-on solid colors as the background color to navigation bars and toolbars. And don't underestimate the importance of using a custom tint color. It'll help your users to not only differentiate context between your own applications, but between others as well. 
Gestures are, are an important part of interaction on mobile devices, since interaction is limited. Using gestures can enhance interaction, and, sorry, and it gives users a sense of direction and manipulation. Uh, you'll always want to spot the, extended, the expected interaction, as people will just expect them to work. Uh, using gestures can be a good way to add shortcuts, but you ne should never use complex gestures as the only way to perform a task. If possible, try not to define new gestures at all, and Apple actually say not to define new gestures at all unless you're a game. Um, and people don't generally make the effort to either discover or remember new gestures. So to aid with usability when you're deep down in a hierarchy, we've added this gesture that allows a user to quickly retreat to the top of a, st of a stack. And we show this message the first time they go through it, but ultimately it's not working for us because people just ignore this message and forget that it can happen. And we get so many complaints about uh, having to tap the back button so many times. So this is something that's not worked, but something we want to improve. And the, a critical thing about this is that users don't like change, and they don't read onboarding. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk, to talk about is extending your desktop. It's probably the most important thing you can provide by using a mobile application, and it's probably the reason you're even making a mobile application. Mobile devices are used completely differently, which can cause a lot of pain in a lot of areas, as I've go already gone through. But they provide plenty of opportunity to complement your feature set. So you could use geofencing to automatically show safety information when you arrive at an industrial site. Or you could use intelligent push notifications to ensure that users are always aware of what's happening, even when they're not sitting at their desk. So we've tried to implicate, integrate with the platform in a number of ways, and we've got plans to do a whole lot more eventually. So for example, on a company screen, an address, when you look at it, doesn't usually mean anything. Maybe the postcode and the state help, but if you're not from around the area, it means nothing. We just display the address on a map, and it gives it so much more context. I can see that, look, this address is near Bicentennial Park, and that tells me a lot especially if there's something in that image that is very well known. And also, we integrate with the rich communication system between provided by the platforms. So for example, you can just tap on the phone, and we'll go to a phone call, one tap. Or if you want to get directions to that address, tap, and you can get directions to that address. So Apple's human interface guidelines have been, uh, haven't always been the easiest document to read, but they have now been updated and sectioned since the iOS 8 beta. And I found it to just be an extremely useful tool for consistent platform design. Uh, they have a couple of case studies on how they ported Keynote and Mail to iOS as well, which, would be, which is really useful and really relevant to this talk as well. Um, but they are a little bit short. And there's a few WWDC sessions from this year uh, which are relevant. The two in the middle are more coding based. The two on the outside are design based. But they're all relevant. Uh, and if you look, go looking through past years, there's heaps more stuff as well. OK, so that's the end of my talk. Um, this is how you can get in contact with me if you, if you have any further questions. But if you have any questions now, I'd love to hear them. All right. All right. Thanks for listening.